Welcome, everyone. It is my pleasure to welcome you to our celebration of International Women's Day with our webinar this morning. Um, and, I, you know, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for joining us. Our webinar is Von Willebrand Disease and Reproductive Tract Bleeding, Pregnancy and Postpartum Bleeding. Thank you so very much for joining us. Next slide, please. My name is Dawn Rodolini, and I will be your chair of the session today. I am proud to serve on the World Federation of Hemophilia as a board member and to chair our Women and Girls with Bleeding Disorders Committee. Thank you so much for joining us. Next slide, please. As you saw in the little video as you were joining, um, this is how you select the language of your preference in the interpretation button on computers or tablets. You can see that you can select this at the bottom of your screen with the little globe, select that for interpretation, and then you can scroll over to select the language of your choice, English, Chinese, French, German, you can see the list there. And then the option is to mute the original English audio as well. Please go to the next slide. So for live interpretation on mobile phones, you can see this here. If you, um, down in the bottom right corner of your phone, you'll see three dots and you can select those to select your interpretation channel. And then um, on your language interpretation, if you can see that in the box, click done to select your language. Next slide, please. More options for uh, questions and answers. You'll see a Q&A button on the bottom of your mobile phone. And to ask a question, please select the Q&A icon and type your question in. And we will be sure to address your questions uh, at the end of our webinar after our presenters have um, shared their information with us. Next slide, please. I'm extremely excited to share this agenda with you. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. We'll have two presentations today. Um, the first from Lakshmi Srivats um, on von Willebrand disease and reproductive tract bleeding. And next we'll hear from Paula James on von Willebrand disease and pregnancy and postpartum bleeding. Then we'll hear for sharing of our experiences from Lauren Phillips from New Zealand. And unfortunately, Kathy uh, Verbreken could not join us today, but um, Lauren will be able to share her experiences and then we'll do Q&A at the end with all of you participating. Next slide, please. So we wanna do a little pre-test with you all. And we'd like to ask if you would rate your knowledge and your skills in the following areas. Von Willebrand disease, reproductive tract bleeding, postpartum bleeding, and the ratings are very poor, which is a one, poor, fair is a three, four as good, five, very good, and six, excellent. You can see this on your screen. Please go ahead and select using your screen. You can select one of these choices. How is your knowledge and skills in von Willebrand disease, which is number one, and reproductive tract bleeding, number two. And then you can scroll down and see the third one under postpartum bleeding. Please select your choices now. For those of you just joining us, it's popping up on your screen. Please rate your knowledge and skills in those following areas using the pop-up poll on your screen. We'll give it a few seconds so that you have the opportunity to select your choice. I see we still have people joining us. Thank you for joining. We've just taken our poll and it looks like we're ready to go to the next screen. So I'm very excited to welcome and introduce you to our panelists and speakers today. We'll start with Dr. Lakshmi Srivas. Dr. Srivas is a professor in the Department of Pediatrics 
the Division of Hematology at University of Texas Health Science Center and McGovern Medical College and Gulf States Hemophilia and Thrombophilia Center in Houston, Texas. She's the Director of Pediatric Thrombosis Clinic and Co-Director of Pediatric Brain and Spine Clinic at her center. Dr. Srivath's clinical and research expertise in the area of pediatric and adolescents, hemostasis and thrombosis, and with many grants, collaborative research, publications, and awards. She has held many leadership positions and is currently the chair for the Women and Girls with Blood Disorders Learning Action Network and co-chair for the Pediatric and Neonatal Thrombosis and Hemostasis Scientific Subcommittee for ISTH. Next, you'll hear from Dr. Paula James, who is a full professor in the Department of Medicine at Queens University. She holds cross appointments to the Department of Pathology and Molecular Medicine and Pediatrics. She's the medical director of the Inherited Bleeding Disorders Clinic of Southeastern Ontario and is aligned and it's aligned women and, women and Bleeding Disorders Clinic. Dr. James is a clinician scientist with an active research program focused on the molecular genetic basis of inherited bleeding disorders and the clinic, clinical impact of these conditions. She's held multiple national and international leadership roles, including clinical co-chair of the 2021 ASH ISTH NHF WFH VWD Guidelines Diagnosis Panel and committee for, excuse me, committee member for the Women's Hemostasis and Thrombosis for ISTH 2024 Congress. And we'll hear from Lauren Phillips, who is a board member of Hemophilia of New Zealand and currently sits on the Women with Inherited Bleeding Disorders Advisory Committee for WFH. She is a von Willebrand disease patient who is passionate about advancing the care of women with bleeding disorders, both at home and across the globe. Lauren lives on the remote west coast of New Zealand with her husband and daughter, where she practices environmental law and enjoys getting out into nature. And unfortunately, Kathy wasn't able to join us this morning and we wish her the very best. And we will move to the next slide, please. So as I said, we are first um, hearing from Dr. Srivats. So I will turn it right over to you, Lakshmi. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Don, for that kind introduction. Um, can I share my screen, please? Could I have my slides? I mean, it's not an, a webinar without a little bit of a glitch, right? <laughs> Can we please have, yep, there we go. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It is my pleasure to be talking to you all about uh, von Willebrand disease and uh, reproductive tract bleeding. Um, I will be specifically focusing on reproductive tract bleeding as part of my presentation today. Here are my disclosures. The objectives of my presentation today are to highlight and discuss the following regarding reproductive tract bleeding in postpubertal females with von Willebrand disease, specifically prevalence, challenges in recognition and evaluation. And I'll also be discussing the management and complications of reproductive tract bleeding in these patients with von Willebrand disease. My talk today will not be complete if I don't mention the name of Dr. Eric von Willebrand, who in April of 1924 was consulted about a five-year-old girl from Follow and Allen Island with uh, complaints of mucocutaneous bleeding. There was also a family history of bleeding in six siblings, three sisters had already passed away because of the condition. Eight years later, our index patient passed away during her fourth menstrual cycle because of heavy menstrual bleeding. Dr. Vaughan Willebrand mapped the family pedigree and, and found that the condition was present both in females as well as males. And so decided that the inheritance will be autosomal, will be dominant 
and then published his famous Swedish language article in 1926 titled Hereditar Pseudohemophily. What he then called pseudohemophily is now known as von Willebrand disease. So let's take a look at the prevalence of von Willebrand disease in patients with heavy menstrual bleeding. I've given you here a graph and a table from a systematic review that looked at several European studies, North American studies and other studies and as shown here, the prevalence ranged anywhere between 5 to about 24% of women with heavy menstrual bleeding. This is much higher when you compare this to the prevalence in the general population of low levels in the range of about 1% and von Willebrand disease in about 1 in 1000 individuals. Looking specifically at adolescent females with heavy menstrual bleeding, I've listed here several studies that have reported on this. The first one is our effort to look at the Centers for Disease Control Female Universal Data Collection Surveillance Project data in US hemophilia treatment centers. These are females already diagnosed with a bleeding disorder and uh, therein you had a very high prevalence of 69%. But when you look at other single and double center studies that I've listed below, you can see that the prevalence rate is anywhere between 7 to 36%, somewhat similar to the adult women data that I showed you earlier. But what is very discomforting is that this uh, database-based study reported that in adolescents with heavy menstrual bleeding, only 8% are even screened for von Willebrand disease. So likely, the prevalence rates that I've shown you here are somewhat of an underestimate of the true prevalence of von Willebrand disease in these females. Let's look at the flip side the prevalence of heavy menstrual bleeding in patients with von Willebrand disease. Studies have shown a prevalence to be anywhere between 32 to 100 percent. I've given you four studies here reported from the uh, hemophilia treatment centers at different time points and as you can see um, these studies have reported a prevalence rate for the heavy menstrual bleeding anywhere between 60 to about 80 percent, a very high prevalence of heavy menstrual bleeding in these patients. During the last decade or so, this entity called low von Willebrand factor has emerged thanks to the initial publication by Dr. Lavin and colleagues from Ireland. And in their Lovic cohort, they reported that the females up to 89% had self-reported menorrhagia, requiring medical consultation, medical therapy, transfusion, hospitalization, surgical therapy as well. And as shown on the picture on the right side, you can see when they were evaluated with various bleeding scores and menorrhagia bleeding scores, they showed a very high prevalence of heavy menstrual bleeding. Patients with von Willebrand factor levels between 30 to 39 had a higher prevalence when compared to those with levels between 40 to 50. Nevertheless, overall, these females suffered from heavy menstrual bleeding. Here in the US, uh, we were interested in looking at uh, adolescent girls with heavy menstrual bleeding and low von Willebrand factor. And we also showed in this multi-center study that these patients had significant heavy menstrual bleeding with an elevated pictorial blood assessment chart score that uh, quantifies heavy menstrual bleeding and also elevated bleeding assessment tool scores. Not only their reproductive tract bleeding, but they also had bleeding related complications such as iron deficiency, anemia requiring red blood cell transfusion and also hospitalization. And in addition to their uh, severe phenotype, they also had many um, bleeding genes present in their genotype, certainly von Willebrand factor gene, but also other platelet related genes. And a new um, uh, report that came through from this publication is that a gene called firm T2 previously reported to suppress platelet aggregation was also present in these patients. Recently, at the American Society of Hematology Annual Conference in 2023, there was an oral presentation that compared the Lovic cohort, that is patients with low von Willebrand factor with levels between 30 to 50, and the uh, WIN cohort, that is the patients with type 1 von Willebrand level, uh, disease with levels less than 30 coming from Netherlands. And this study showed that in the Lovic cohort, 39% had normalization of their factor levels over time. And in the WIN cohort, only 47% had persistently low levels, whereas one third of these patients increased their factor levels into the low von Willebrand factor range over time, and 23% had complete normalization of their factor levels, concluding that perhaps low von Willebrand factor is not a distinct entity, but a continuum of an age-dependent type 1 von Willebrand disease evolving phenotype. Let's move on to looking at the 
other reproductive tract bleeding, namely hemorrhagic ovarian cyst. Studies have reported a prevalence of anywhere between 16 to 60 percent, but case reports have really highlighted the severity of this complication. As you can see in this picture, here is an ovarian cyst that is hemorrhagic, severely enlarged and threatening to rupture. And when it ruptures, it can lead to hemoperitoneum, cause hemorrhagic shock, requiring surgery, red cell transfusion, von Willebrand factor replacement and other surgical therapies. So it can be pretty severe complication. So we now have seen that in females with von Willebrand disease and reproductive tract bleeding, they can have medical complications like iron deficiency and anemia. They can re require surgical procedures like endometrial ablation and hysterectomy. And they can have gynecologic complications that we saw as hemorrhagic ovarian cyst, but also they can have endometriosis, fibroids, endometrial hyperplasia, and endometrial polyps. And not only that, these patients can develop symptoms of depression, anxiety, have missed school and work days, and all these leading to overall decreased quality of life. So it becomes extremely important to evaluate these patients presenting with reproductive tract bleeding thoroughly for the presence of von Willebrand disease. And it is uh, the current recommendation that these patients be evaluated in a multidisciplinary setting, wherein they can be evaluated by both a hematologist as well as a gynecology physician, uh, taking a very good history, both personal and family history of bleeding, good physical examination, employing bleeding assessment tools, including the pictorial blood assessment chart score for heavy menstrual bleeding. For lab evaluation, uh, we would initially do a complete blood count a prothrombin time and a partial thromboplastin time and fibrinogen, but also in females presenting with reproductive tract bleeding, it is important to do the von Willebrand factor levels upfront. The, uh, the algorithm on the right side is taken from the recent guidelines uh, on the evaluation of von Willebrand disease. And as you can see here, when the von Willebrand factor levels come back abnormal, based on their levels, and employing other additional testing, including genetic testing, then these patients can be diagnosed as having type 1 von Willebrand disease, which is the milder and the most common form of von Willebrand disease, or type 2 or type 3, which are the more severe forms of von Willebrand disease. One Dr. Shikas, we have a quick quick request from the interpreters to slow down a little bit. They're having a hard time keeping up. Thank you. Thank you. One recommendation from this panel that I want to highlight is that uh, the panel recommends that the diagnosis of type 1 von Willebrand disease be given not only to patients with levels less than 0.3 international units per ml, but also to those patients with levels between 0.3 and 0.5 international units and presenting with abnormal bleeding, thanks to some of the articles on adult women and adolescent females on low von Willebrand factor that I showed you earlier. When we try to diagnose von Willebrand disease in these patients, we come across several diagnostic challenges. The time of testing is important because during menstruation, the von Willebrand factor levels are at the lowest. During pregnancy, the levels can increase, leading to falsely normal levels. And the site of testing, if it is in a remote facility, this can lead to delay in processing and result in lowering of the von Willebrand factor levels. High dose estrogen can increase the factor levels. Historically, we've been using the von Willebrand Ristocetin cofactor assay, which has several challenges, including poor reproducibility, inter-assay and inter-lab variability, and a high diagnostic error rate. So the newer platelet-dependent glycoprotein 1BM and glycoprotein 1BR assays are more sensitive and specific for diagnosing von Willebrand disease accurately, but these assays are not readily available at all centers globally. Also, when interpreting the von Willebrand test results, one needs to keep in mind that there are many other physiologic conditions that can either increase or decrease the von Willebrand factor levels. Also, studies have shown that there are population differences in von Willebrand factor levels. Africans have been shown to have a higher level when compared to Caucasians and Indians. We and others have shown that exon 28 variants in African-American females can lead to in vitro low factor levels when tested with the Ristocetin cofactor assay. This can be overcome by employing the platelet dependent assays. Also, we know that blood group O patients can have lower levels when compared to patients who are non-blood group O. 
But we also know that when we make a diagnosis of von Willebrand disease, it is only based on the von Willebrand factor levels and not on the presence or absence of blood group O. Let's move on to looking at the management strategies for reproductive tract bleeding, hormonal therapy, either with combined hormonal contraceptives or if there is concern for thrombosis or thrombophilia with progestin only therapy can be employed as upfront treatment for these patients. Amongst uh, antifibrinolytic agents, tranexamic acid can be used as a standalone therapy for these patients. Aminocaproic acid typically is used only as a supplemental therapy. Desmopressin is not a frontline therapy, mainly because it is not very effective in the more severe forms of von Willebrand disease, namely type 2 and type 3. In patients with severe von Willebrand disease, they may also need von Willebrand factor replacement. We have both plasma derived as well as recombinant von Willebrand factor. And when the bleeding is extremely severe, one may have to resort to surgical therapy such as endometrial ablation or hysterectomy. We also advise these patients about avoiding medications that will affect uh, increase the risk for bleeding and also to avoid activities that can cause uh, bleeding and also manage their other medical complications such as anemia uh, and iron deficiency with either red cell transfusion iron therapy or with iron rich food. I want to take a minute to highlight the recent guidelines on the management of von Willebrand disease, a collaborative effort between American Society of Hematology, ISTH, National Hemophilia Foundation and also World Federation of Hemophilia. This panel recommends that for patients with von Willebrand disease and heavy menstrual bleeding, hormonal contraception including the levonorgestrel intrauterine system or tranexamic acid can be used as frontline therapy over desmopressin and that it does not have to be monotherapy. The patients can get combined therapy, tailoring the therapy to the given individual and that these patients need to be evaluated in a multidisciplinary clinic setting. Why? Because it is important not only to manage their heavy menstrual bleeding and their medical complications such as iron deficiency and anemia, but also to do a thorough gynecologic assessment and to manage their gynecologic complications as well. I will now quickly show some novel trials that have been done in this patient population. Recom recombinant human interleukin 11 was tried as a single center phase two trial in a small number of women and was shown to reduce the PBAC score, but this has not uh, made it into the frontline therapy. The recently completed von Willebrand disease MIN trial compared a single injection of recombinant von Willebrand factor versus oral tranexamic acid in a phase 3 multicenter trial. And uh, the results were that tranexamic acid was more effective in reducing the PBAC score when compared to recombinant von Willebrand factor. In a very small number of patients, octreotide has been shown to reduce heavy menstrual bleeding. This brings me to the end of my talk. I hope I have impressed upon you that when we do diagnose von Willebrand disease in a female presenting with reproductive tract bleeding, it not only helps with the management of her reproductive tract bleeding and her medical complications like iron deficiency and anemia, but also helps with other bleeding management, with perioperative and dental intervention, with trauma-related bleeding management, pregnancy and postpartum bleeding management that Dr. Paula James is going to talk about next, and also to give her a lifestyle modification advice to prevent lifelong bleeding in that female. In addition, by screening and evaluating affected relatives, we are able to establish the diagnosis in her affected relatives as well. So when you diagnose von Willebrand disease in, in one female, you are able to manage her family as a whole. With that, I'll conclude my presentation. I want to thank the World Federation of Hemophilia for this wonderful opportunity. I also gave this presentation on behalf of the Foundation for Women and Girls with Blood Disorders. At the end of uh, this webinar, I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you so much. You did an amazing job of covering so much information that's really important for all of us to understand and know. Thank you very much. And like we, we will have Q&A at the end of the sessions. Next up is Paula James discussing von Willebrand disease and pregnancy and postpartum bleeding. Dr. James, take it away. If we could unmute Dr. James, please. 
Julia, is there a way to unmute? There we go. Yeah. I see that happened. <laughs> yeah, great. Thanks so much, Dawn. And thank you to uh, WFH and the organizers for including me uh, in this session today. Happy International Women's Day to everyone. And I'm delighted to talk with you today about one of my favorite topics and one of my favorite groups of patients to look after, um, those with von Willebrand disease who are pregnant. And so here are my disclosures. So this morning I'm planning to cover the physiologic changes that occur in the hemostatic system during pregnancy and the impact of those changes on VWD patients, and then to discuss the management of VWD patients in pregnancy, during labor and delivery, and in the postpartum period. So pregnancy is a time of profound physiologic change, um, and this is adaptive uh, and is designed to optimize the environment for the fetus, but also to prevent uh, significant hemorrhage, especially at the time of the separation of the placenta, which is really one of the most significant hemostatic challenges that a body can undergo. Um, and so these adaptive changes to the hemostatic system are really to prevent antepartum and postpartum bleeding. This is a bit of a summary of the kinds of changes that happen over pregnancy. Um, relevant to VWD patients, of course, is the increase in both factor VIII and von Willebrand factor. Uh, and this is what we see in normal pregnancy in individuals who don't have von Willebrand disease. When we look at the risk of bleeding that I alluded to earlier, um, you can see in the middle column, the rates of significant bleeding across pregnancy, across the three uh, trimesters, and then in the postpartum period in individuals without von Willebrand disease in this middle column, and then individuals with von Willebrand disease on the right. And you can see that across the board, the rates of bleeding are higher. We especially see first trimester bleeding in uh, patients with von Willebrand disease. Doesn't always mean that the pregnancy will be lost. Uh, many times that settles. Um, and you can see that the rates do go down across pregnancy, but we do have increased rates of postpartum hemorrhage um, that are important for us to pay attention to and to try to minimize. Uh, this publication from a number of years ago take took a look at what happens to those changes in von Willebrand factor and factor VIII in VWD pregnancy. So you can see uh, normal controls here on the top left, and then type 1 VWD, type 2, type 3 isn't on this slide, but I will explain what happens there. So as I alluded to, um, the, the figures here have VWFN factor VIII, and you can see in Normal pregnancy, those levels go up starting early in pregnancy um, and peak around the time of delivery. In type one, you see a lesser increase, but in many patients, that's actually enough to get their VWF and factor eight levels into the normal range, except those type one patients that have increased clearance. Um, we may not see normalization in those patients. Across the bottom here are uh, type two patients. And at the very bottom is von Willebrand factor activity in 2A and in 2M. And one of the challenges that we have in type two pregnancy is that VWF antigen and factor eight levels increase, but the activity doesn't. And that's one of the things we have to be aware of when we're managing um, those patients. In type three, essentially it would be a flat line across the bottom. Uh, when there is no von Willebrand factor being made, there is no opportunity for that to increase over the course of pregnancy. And so this is a really important paper uh, from Dr. Andy James, taking a look at what happens to VWF and factor eight levels, not only in normal women and in women with von Willebrand disease who don't require treatment in their pregnancy, and then comparing to women who get treated. So in each of these panels, 
the top is uh, normal. So a woman without von Willebrand disease. The middle is somebody with von Willebrand disease whose levels normalized in pregnancy. And then the bottom is those with VWD who we treated. And treatment um, in this study included desmopressin or VWF factor eight replacement. An important note in this study is that tranexamic acid was not um, commonly being used at this time to prevent postpartum bleeding. So you'll see uh, why that's important on the next slide. And so the point I wanna make here is that patients who have levels increased during pregnancy still don't get to a normal level. And if we treat individuals with von Willebrand disease, we are generally not, at least for the postpartum period, treating to the same level that they would be at um, otherwise. Generally, at the time of labor and delivery, we are treating to something um, more physiologic, but not for an extended period. And the reason that matters is because of this figure um, from that same paper, which took a look at those same three groups of patients. So um, in each of the weeks, we've got normal individuals on the left, those who normalize their levels, who have BWD in the middle, and then on the right, individuals with BWD who we treated. And the really worrisome thing that we see here is that although bleeding, um, and so what we're looking at here is a PBAC score, so it's a measurement of the amount of postpartum blood loss, is probably similar in the first week or two, but then it shifted, and it shifted um, in a bad way so that individuals with VWD, even though we were treating them, had more bleeding at three and four and five and six weeks. And I think that relates back to the previous slide where we aren't extending any kind of treatment out longer to prevent this from happening. So I'm gonna shift and cover um, how I treat uh, VWD patients. And we're, we'll start by talking about pre-pregnancy. So I think the management of um, pregnancy starts before and I talk with all of my patients about what the risk is to the baby based on inheritance. And so as we heard from Dr. Srivast, most BWD is autosomal dominant. So the risk to the baby is 50-50, so 50% 50 chance of having an affected child. Type 2N and type 3 are autosomal recessive though, or in some cases co-dominant, which means the baby usually has a milder phenotype or is a carrier, except if the partner if the father also has von Willebrand disease. And that's really important if there's consanguinity. So if parents are related, that can increase the risk of severe von Willebrand disease um, in the baby. We've heard from Dr. Srivast about the importance of iron deficiency. That's critically important during pregnancy. We've got good data that shows us there are bad outcomes for baby and for mom. Um, if the mother is iron deficient during pregnancy. So it's really important to identify it and correct it. And also to work with our obstetrics um, colleagues to make sure that people understand what's gonna happen during pregnancy, what kind of care they will require and how we're gonna manage labor and delivery. I wanna take a, a moment to highlight tranexamic acid, which you also heard about from Dr. Srivast, which is I think one of the most important drugs ever developed. This um, medication is a fibrinolytic inhibitor, which means it prevents clot breakdown and is super helpful um, for mucosal bleeding, for postpartum bleeding. Um, there are huge studies that have been done with this medication, uh, over 20,000 pregnant women, and this medication was shown to reduce death from postpartum hemorrhage with no increase in the risk of thrombosis. And I think back when that Andy James study was done, one of the reasons that tranexamic acid wasn't being used in the postpartum period was because of this concern of thrombosis or creating a deep venous thrombosis or a pulmonary embolus. And this huge study um, provided us with reassurance that that does not happen. Um, there's some retrospective data that was published as well on um, women with bleeding disorders showing a, reduce in, a reduction in postpartum blood loss and no adverse effects. So that data made its way into one of the recommendations from the VWD management guideline. 
Um, and the guideline panel suggests the use of tranexamic acid over not using it in women with type 1 BWD, also in types 2 and 3 uh, during the postpartum period. It's a conditional recommendation, not because we didn't believe um, in what we were saying. It's because the strength of evidence is low. And one of the takeaways from today is that I think we need stronger evidence so that we can strengthen this kind of recommendation. An important point about tranexamic acid is that it is safe for breastfeeding. So to move then into pregnancy, um, how do we manage pregnancy in the postpartum period? So I see everybody at 32 weeks and I measure their CBC, ferritin and BWF and factor eight levels. If they're iron deficient, if I hadn't done my job right and corrected it earlier in the pregnancy, certainly I'm gonna correct it at this point. And then I divide patients into two groups. Those that have levels that have normalized, so VWF and factor eight are greater than 0 0.50 or greater than 50%, and those who have not, which I will come to um, on the next slide. If somebody has normalized their levels, my approach is to say the delivery should be as obstetrically indicated. My hospital serves a very large um, geographic area and if somebody has normal levels, we, uh, myself and the obstetricians I work with, will allow delivery in a community hospital. I make sure that I say in my consult note that there is no increased risk of bleeding with regional anesthesia to hopefully allow an epidural if that's what the patient wants. I don't prescribe any prophylactic treatment for labor and delivery. I do say to avoid forceps or any kind of manipulation of the baby's head if possible because of that 50% risk that the baby's gonna be affected. Otherwise, normal newborn care um, should be provided. And then everybody, unless there's really a clear contraindication should get tranexamic acid. And the way I do this is that I start it on postpartum day one, uh, a gram POTID, and I continue it until the bleeding stops. So for many patients, this is a couple of weeks of postpartum tranexamic acid. This is the majority of von Willebrand disease patients, not all. Um, but 80 to 90% of patients can be managed like this. 10 to 20% though, do not get above 50% with their VWF and factor eight levels. And as I showed on that previous slide, that's more common with type two and certainly with type three patients. And so at 32 weeks, if the levels are still low, we still allow the delivery to take place as obstetrically indicated, but it has to happen at a tertiary care center. Um, and uh, these patients we generally admit on a Monday, first thing in the morning, for an elective induction so that we are in control of the timing and that this isn't happening on a long weekend when all of our staff aren't around. We still manage the baby's head in a similar way with normal newborn care. Everybody gets tranexamic acid, but in addition, we have to give treatment that increases VWF and factor eight levels. And at my center, we prefer von Willebrand factor replacement to desmopressin. The sodium and uh, water effects of desmopressin are a challenge uh, around the time of labor and delivery. And so we use von Willebrand factor replacement. In Canada, we have plasma derived products, but recombinant products are um, a reasonable choice here as well. And I aim for around 100%. Um, and try to maintain that through labor and delivery. I do this with a bolus and continuous infusion because I have an incredible nurse uh, who is very committed to these patients and will run that continuous infusion the entire time our patients are in. Bolus dosing is entirely a reasonable way to go here as well. So we give a bolus, we start the infusion, I check hours, for, I check levels four hours later, and if I have everything where I want it, I will tell obstetrics that they can go ahead with the induction. Once I have levels normal, I also give the okay for regional anesthesia, except in patients with 2B von Willebrand disease, if they are thrombocytopenic. And then I check the levels daily and adjust the continuous infusion as necessary. Uh, the VWD management guideline um, prioritized a question about regional anesthesia or neuroaxial anesthesia and um, took a look at levels and 
suggest that a target level of that around 100% or one international unit per mil over targeting a higher level was reasonable. Um, and that the level should be maintained while the epidural is in place and then for at least six hours after it comes out. So to summarize what I've covered uh, this morning, uh, I cannot emphasize enough the importance of identifying and correcting iron deficiency. Uh, I think pregnant patients with VWD need to have their levels checked at 32 weeks. Most type 1 patients correct and can be managed with tranexamic acid alone, but type 2 and type 3 patients generally will not and require a much higher level of intervention and care. The involvement of obstetrics is really important um, to provide multidisciplinary care. And I think tranexamic acid should be given to just about everybody uh, with von Willebrand disease who is having a baby. One thing I would highlight, and you probably got this sense from how I've been talking, the exact level we should be targeting is not known. Um, and I think is certainly something we should focus on with future research. So I want to acknowledge my team uh, here in Kingston and again thank you for your attention um, and to all of the organizers for involving me today. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. That was an excellent presentation. Um, unfortunately, I had said in the beginning that Lauren was joining us um, unfortunately, she's having difficulty connecting, so um, we're going to go right to q and I'm going to remind you to please um, submit your questions in the Q&A box. We've already got a couple of questions started, and so Lakshmi, thank you for joining us, uh, coming back on. Um, I will go ahead and dive into the Q&A, um, and I'm not sure if we have a next slide, but um, if that's not, yeah, perfect. Let's do that. That's perfect. So our first question, um, Dr. Srivath, so I'm going to go to you. And it says, I have a 30-year-old female patient with easy bruising and workup found pseudothrombocytopenia, by the way, hopefully I get an A plus for that, um, with platelet clumping. She had a VWF antigen of 60% and a reported VWF activity of 17%. And they have no access to uh, VWF uh, resistin res cofactor or multimer analysis, and how would you classify this patient? Sure, I'm happy to answer that question. So I think that's a very interesting and an important question. Um, um, so I see that uh, the same person has said that uh, the activity is actually the restocytin cofactor activity, and they just don't have access to multimer analysis. Um, so one wonders if you know where the site of testing was whether it was um, at their center or was it at a remote site. Uh, so that's an important thing to think about because as I mentioned in my presentation, if the site is remote, then that can uh, artificially lead to decrease in the von Willebrand uh, factor levels because of uh, delay in processing, et cetera. Um, so it becomes important to repeat the testing. Uh, but uh, what is uh, striking there is that there is a discrepancy between the von Willebrand activity level and the antigen level. So even if you don't have a multiple analysis readily available, one can quickly calculate the von Willebrand factor activity to antigen ratio. And there are some guidelines, and I think as per the recent uh, von Willebrand disease management guidelines, if the ratio is less than 0.7. So in this patient, I calculated the ratio to be 0.28. So significantly low ratio. That indicates the more severe type 2 von Willebrand disease. Um, but uh, what I also see interesting is that the patient has platelet clumping. Um, so perhaps this could maybe uh, be one of the uh, types of the uh, type 2 von Willebrand disease. So you have different types, type 2A, type 2B, type 2M, and type 2N. Uh, because of uh, you know lack of time, I couldn't go into the details about the different types. But type 2B is because of gain of function mutation where that in increases platelet aggregation. So patients can present with thrombocytopenia and platelet clumping. So perhaps this is type 2B, but nevertheless, if you repeat the testing and the results are consistent, then this is probably type 2 von Willebrand disease, a more severe von Willebrand disease, uh, will warrant a detailed history taking about the 
bleeding, including reproductive tract bleeding. She's a 30 year old female, uh, you know, may get pregnant. And so what Dr. James talked about uh, becomes very important during her pregnancy and postpartum management. So very important to repeat testing and accurately diagnose this patient. Thank you so much. Dr. James, um, could you comment on using DDAVP during pregnancy? Yeah, thanks for the question. There certainly is a, a literature around this um, that it is safe to do. And I think if somebody is pregnant and requires a procedure, that might be a reasonable place to use desmopressin. I mentioned that I'm reluctant to use it at the time of labor and delivery. And the reason for that is because of the hyponatremia. Um, and the fact that you've got an unknown big hemostatic challenge coming up when the placenta separates. And if you've given desmopressin, generally we would say if you're gonna use it for labor and delivery to give it after the cord is clamped, um, but then you have potentially created some limitations in terms of fluid resuscitation and the risk of hyponatremia, which can lead to um, seizure. So I, I am, hesitant about using it for labor and delivery. If it's all you have, uh, certainly I would be using tranexamic acid. And then I think if that's what you've got, I think be very careful and be aware of those risks of um, hyponatremia and be, be cautious with fluid resuscitation. Thank you very much. Dr. Srivast, um, I think you'll take the question on how do you differentiate between a woman with hemophilia and a woman with von Willebrand disease? Um, I love that question because uh, I'm, I'm totally passionate about uh, females with bleeding disorders. And uh, um, for a long time, uh, women with hemophilia were not well uh, diagnosed and recognized. So it is important to know that females uh, who are carriers of hemophilia can also have low levels and can have disease manifestation. Um, so one important thing is to definitely get von Willebrand factor levels in those patients. And, and if they are uh, in the normal range, and that is more suggestive of just hemophilia, if only factor eight level is low, then that's suggestive of hemophilia diagnosis. Of course, one can employ uh, uh, definitely um, genetic testing uh, to confirm the diagnosis further. Uh, another um, situation where this can be quite confusing and uh, uh, has had been a clinical situation in a patient that I had seen previously is a patient presenting with low factor eight. Uh, then it is important to also think about von Willebrand disease and not just make a diagnosis of hemophilia carrier status there because von Willebrand 2N patients can present with low factor eight. So that I need to keep that in mind as well. So um, you need to consider both the diagnosis and employ additional testing to confirm diagnosis. Thank you so much. Um, the next person says, thank you so much for the great talk, Dr. James. Understanding the exact target of v uh, factor eight and VWF for delivery is not known, but in your personal practice, what do you target? As long as VWF is greater than 50, do you not provide additional factor replacement? Um, are there certain situations where you do give VWF replacement if the levels are marginally above 50? So thanks for that question. Um, and I'm happy actually to come back to this because just given time, I went over this quickly. I aim for about 100%, but um, that's really tricky, in especially in type 2, because what happens in type 2 is that you're starting with an activity that's a fair bit lower than the antigen and the factor 8. And when you replace, that generally still happens. And so you're walking this tightrope of trying to make sure that you've got a normal von Willebrand factor activity, but that you're not pushing the VWF antigen and factor eight too high, which makes you get concerned about thrombosis if you keep it there for a long time. So it's much easier to get everything kind of around 100% actually in type one and in type three, where there's parallel between the activity and the antigen. The question about... Um, if the levels are greater than 50%, I do not routinely also give von Willebrand factor replacement in those cases. I use tranexamic acid across the board and we have had very good experience with that. I could imagine a situation where I might get pushed to do that and it would maybe be somebody who I had managed a previous labor and delivery with only tranexamic acid and who had problems. Um, 
to be type twos, even if I'm seeing levels above, I am, I worry, especially about to be, that might be another situation where I would think maybe I want to push things a little bit higher, but in general, tranexamic acid, if the levels are above 50% and we've had good experience with that approach. Thank you so much. Um, so from Roshni Kalkarni, should women with all types of VWD get oral tranexamic acid for approximately 12 weeks post-delivery to prevent secondary postpartum hemorrhage? And what's your opinion about intramuscular tranexamic acid during delivery? Both Dr. Srivast and I are so honored and delighted to have Dr. Kalkarni um, online today. Hello, Roshni, we hope you're doing well. You could answer this question, um, I think, better than anyone. So yes, I think everybody with von Willebrand disease, unless there's really a clear contraindication, should get oral tranexamic acid to prevent postpartum bleeding. I don't actually specify the duration. And in my experience, I haven't had to go as long as 12 weeks. What I do is um, I say that I want them to take tranexamic acid until the bleeding has stopped. And I give them a prescription for three weeks and I put repeats on it. And I do that because my nurse checks in with them at three weeks and we make a decision. Okay, I, I think there is still some bleeding. Things are getting a lot better, but let's maybe go a little bit longer and, and just make sure that that bleeding has stopped because I don't want there to be um, a stutter. I don't want the bleeding to stop. And then you stop the tranexamic acid and then the bleeding comes back. So I haven't had to go as long as 12 weeks. I would say generally we're probably going three or four weeks. Uh, which is much better than in that Andy James paper where bleeding was going on for, you know, five or, or six weeks. I actually don't have experience with IM tranexamic acid. And if somebody had normalized levels, I think that would actually be something I would allow. Um, but Dr. Kulkarni, if you want to put your experience with that in the chat, we'd be delighted to hear it. And again, thank you so much for being here today. Yes, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Srivast, so we have about two more minutes for our Q&A, and then um, we'll we'll start to close out, but I want to make sure we get this question in. So Dr. Srivast, how would you advise treatment of a bleeding episode in a patient with VWD at a center or in a country in which access to recombinant VWF is not available? Yeah, that's a very good question. Thank you. Um, and certainly, I think, I mean, in the United States, uh, even in, and probably in other um, developed countries, uh, recombinant von Willebrand factor is um, approved and available in adult women. But in the pediatric uh, world, we still don't have that approved. So um, depending on the type of the bleeding, you have several options, even in a remote uh, center uh, to utilize. So for example, if it is just recurrent mucosal bleeding or the patient is going for a dental procedure in uh, those situations, uh, one can uh, certainly utilize antifibrinolytic agents, both tranexamic acid as well as aminocaproic acid, depending on what is available. Uh, for um, uh, mild, uh, minor procedures, um, you can also utilize uh, desmopressin. Just keep in mind that it has the phenomenon of tachyphylaxis, uh, meaning with repeated use, the levels will start to come down. And so you can only use it for a maximum of about three to four consecutive days. Uh, but if you do need it for a, a more severe bleeding or for a, a major surgical procedure, etc., certainly plasma-derived von Willebrand factor can be administered, and we still utilize that in the pediatric and in the adolescent patients with von Willebrand disease um, here as well. So that is certainly an option. Thank you. Um, okay, we're going to sneak this last question in in 60 seconds or less. Can you answer this one? My four-year-old son has frequent nosebleeds, occasional bruising, but that could be explained by him being active and playing. Are nosebleeds on average once a month uh, negligible and should be explored further? We don't have known history of bleeding disorders in our family. I really wanted to get that question in. Yeah, I mean, I think that is a situation that we see often in pediatric patients, uh, especially in a very active uh, child. Uh, but uh, nosebleeds, I think it is not just the nosebleed. Um, so we have some bleeding assessment tools that we utilize uh, to help with the making a diagnosis. So we need to look at the characteristics of the nosebleed. So how frequent is it? How long lasting is it? Uh, you know, does it require medical consultation or other management? I mean, we do see patients with bleeding disorders coming in with nosebleeds lasting for 30 minutes, coming to the emergency room, you know, dropping their hemoglobin and requiring medical management. So all those characteristics will add up 
So or if the patient is just having uh, nosebleeds once a month, just last for like one or two minutes, that may not be very significant. Also, I um, mean, trauma is the most important cause for nosebleeds in children. So we'll need to explore and see if that is what is provoking. But if it is more prolonged and more severe, then I think certainly that needs to be explored further. Thank you so much. Thank you both uh, for taking the time to presenting this information that's so important and also for, for taking the time to answer everyone's questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions, but we will make sure that we do our best to answer those. Um, just a reminder that this uh, webinar is being recorded and you will be able to access the webinar on the e-learning platform for WFH. And if we could go to our post knowledge skills test. So please, now that you have participated in this webinar, if you could please rank your knowledge and skills in the following areas, von Willebrand disease, reproductive tract bleeding, and postpartum bleeding. And the answers are very poor is one, two is poor, three is fair, four is good, five is very good, and six is excellent. Please take your time now to select your answers of how you feel after listening to this webinar and if your knowledge has increased. I feel like we need music, should we sing? <laughs> So we'll give it a few seconds because we want to make sure everyone has the opportunity to uh, take the, the post-webinar knowledge questions. Hopefully you learned. I learned a lot and I was trying to take notes, but also pay attention to the questions. So <laughs> I can't wait to go back and, and actually watch the, the webinar so that I can watch it as a consumer and really ab absorb the information. Thank you everyone so much for taking the time to uh, to rank, you know, your knowledge increased after this. Next slide, please. So I'm very excited to highlight this slide. In just a month, we will be all, oh, go back, please. Thank you. Um, we will all be headed to Madrid, Spain for the 2024 World Congress. And I'm really excited um, to invite you to participate. Registration is open. The link is in the chat. And we have, a re if you're interested in this webinar, we have some ex excellent sessions at Congress this year on von Willebrand disease, women and girls with bleeding disorders. And um, I hope that you'll join us. Next slide, please. Also with shared decision-making, you can um, see these webinars have already been um, started, but up next, just on March 12th, four days, is the next shared decision-making WFH webinar. Um, it is a three-part series, and you can watch the post, the, the webinar that happened on February 27th, and then also mark your calendars for March 26th. Next slide, please. And we could not let this webinar go without asking for your support of our WFH Global Champions. Our Global Champions program is the perfect opportunity to share your commitment to the global bleeding disorders community. Our champions are committed and passionate, and we are donors on a mission to improve and sustain care for people living with inherited bleeding disorders around the globe. You can scan that QR code and make your donation today. We really, really appreciate it. And I'm proud to say I am a global champion. And next slide, please. So with that, thank you all. Thank you for joining us. Happy International Women's Day. Please share the recording link with everybody and anybody that you know once it's posted on the e-learning website. Dr. James, Dr. Srivast, thank you so much for joining us today. And I hope you all have a great rest of your day. <laughs>